Brian Beeler here. We are out at Chilldyne and we are checking out the latest innovations in liquid cooling for your data center. Chilldyne, as you've seen in our social videos, no doubt, has a unique value proposition where they're negative pressure system, which means if any of these lines in this system or this system that we're working on gets cut, the system keeps working no matter what. The hybrid heat sinks also allow the system to continue working without the liquid loop with the fans that are in place there, these systems stay up, no fluid, no mess, zero downtime, zero leaks. This is really sweet tech. Now part of what powers it is this big beefy CDU. This has got an amazing negative pressure system. These pumps will tell you all about that, why this three chamber system is so important in the deployment with the Chill9 CDUs. They've got filtration in here. They've got a nice touch screen panel for management. And inside there's all sorts of other things that are gonna be really interesting, including the additives that the system drops in automatically to make sure any grime and, and green stuff and other nasties are dealt with. Now, if we come over here, there's a bunch more that we're gonna tell you about. All of these cold plates are all part of Chilldyne's innovative feature set, and part of that includes these little turbulator guys, and we're gonna tell you all about these, the plastics versus the metals and the shapes and all of what they can do. The manifolds is another big part of their value proposition. The way these things connect is really impressive and you'll notice that there's almost no fittings anywhere in their system because of the negative pressure sucks in there automatically and keeps the, the uh, bond nice and tight. We've got plenty of servers. We're gonna show you those two Dells before, but this is a Penguin Open 19 system that's using the cold plates and the liquid cooling loop, another really great innovation. What's more is they've got some mock-ups for uh, Grace Hopper CPUs. The metal ones will be here soon. And we've got a special trick where they're gonna show us their 2000 watt system, which is really cool. This is that tank we were looking at before that's filled up with uh, the blue liquid. This is an empty version, but we're looking again at all the engineering that goes into these systems. And just when you thought they could only do data center, Chilldyne is not a one trick pony. They could cool rockets, they can cool anything. They've done these systems with a liquid loop, with GPUs inside a workstation type rig, with an internal manifold. Again, these just pull off and connect back in. There, there's no couplings to fail. That's really cool. And then if you swing around over here, you can check out, they've even done this with a 4090 with a little teeny heat sink on a graphics card. They've got everything under the sun covered. While it's mostly data center, as I said, all of this technology and knowledge is really cool, really special. And Jordan, what are you doing over here? You said any leak. Oh! You just tomahawk chopped the line. Yeah, it didn't leak. Okay, so not only is it not leaking, these two systems are still running and the CDU is happy as can be. It doesn't care. All right, so we've got a lot to cover. Jordan's gonna put this back together. Stay tuned for more from Chilldyne. All right, so we've got this Dell R760 here that we've uh, already had pre-converted. We've got the clear tubes in here so we can see the liquid flowing and what's happening through the loop as the system's working. We can see the negative pressure and effect on both sides. We've got our R6625 over here that we've also converted that we're gonna be running some benchmarks on and monitoring the thermals as the uh, fluid's flowing through and as we make changes to the amount of vacuum or introduce a leak or something like that in the loop. So in order to demonstrate this, the first thing we have to do is go turn the system on. It's a really complex process. Follow me over there for that. The first thing you have to do to turn on your Chilldyne CDU is come over here and flip the switch up. After that, it's as simple as pushing the run button front and center. System's now turning on and it's engaged. So let's go back over to our servers and see what they're doing. We've got the fluid actively flowing through the system right now. This system's not on because we've got it opened up for demonstration purposes. The classic demo that we've all seen a hundred times, we love it though, cutting the line, that easy. Now, at this point, the system would still be running and it still would be receiving active cooling thanks to the fins on the top of the heat sink. There's actually so much thermal mass in there, it takes a significant amount of time in order to heat up to a point where you would even consider a thermal throttle event. So watch how quick this is when we plug it back together here. It's really neat. You can see the, the suction take the water immediately back through and it fills up and now the server is back on liquid cooling. There's not a drop in here, nothing like that thanks to that negative pressure. So to show you and prove that the temperature works that way, we're gonna move over to another demo over here on the R6625. All right, so let's go ahead and kick off a workload. We're gonna do a Y Cruncher CPU only test here. We're gonna do a uh, 100 billion 
digit Pi. This will load up the CPU for us nicely. We, it's gonna take it a second here and you'll start to see the loads pop up. We'll start to see our temperatures go up. Now we are on the liquid loop right now. It's co connected over here to the CDU and it's passing liquid through both CPUs. So we'll give it a second here to let it fully load up. All right, so the workload's underway. We've got our temperatures stable here. We're sitting about the uh, 50 degrees, uh, 55 uh, average across all the cores. So let's go ahead and cut this and see what happens to the server under full load. All right, so as expected, the liquid gets sucked both back into the tube on both sides. And to demonstrate the suction on each side here, I actually had them get me a nice cup of water here. So you can see that that side's gonna go ahead and suck it down and that side will go ahead and suck it down too. So that's how they achieve the ability to not have any sort of leak problems with this because the water is going out on both sides. Again, it's as easy as replacing this cut piece on here and slapping a new tube in in order to restore the server. Again, this would be applicable if you had to do a quick move or you had to do a quick recabling behind the rack and you needed to move one of these. You're not gonna disrupt any of the flow. Our temperatures never went above, let's see, our max on there, it peaked at uh, 77 Celsius for a moment. Not anywhere near any sort of throttling range. The server fans were more than enough to pick up and take over with the copper and the amount of thermal mass that's in there to compensate for the temporary line break. So I'm here with uh, Steve Harrington at uh, Childine and we're looking at their cold plate designs. So this is a selection of the Childine cold plates that have been deployed and some we're working on. First, this is the cold plate that we use for Sandia with the dual Skylake server. And here's an example of one of the servers that are at Sandia. This server also includes valves that restrict the flow in, of air into other servers in case this one is leaking, all the other servers in the rack. This is the kit that we ship to Penguin, the server manufacturer includes two cold plates and the connectors. This is the latest thing we are developing is the Grace Hopper cold plates for the NVIDIA system. Right now these are plastic mock-ups that we use for fit test. Uh, the actual parts should be here later this week. Another cold plate that we developed recently is the cold plate for the 4090 from NVIDIA. And this one includes some turbulators that are actually soldered into the cold plate and that gives us better heat transfer, better performance. And this is the next generation design we're working on. This one includes a grooved uh, extrusion with turbulators placed into every groove. These are some other of the uh, the latest designs, this is for SP5. Again, this is more of a mass producible, low cost version. This is what it looks like inside. Basically has a plastic cover. It has grooves in the cold plate. And then in each groove is a turbulator. In this case, they're plastic. We also have some of those with soldered in copper turbulators for more higher performance applications. That was a great overview of all the uh, different cold plate designs. Now, what I'm really curious is inside of these, there are these uh, turbulators. You commented on them before. I see some are plastic, some are metal, some are soldered in. What role do these play in uh, the design of the cold plates? So what happens is when the water flows in the cold plate, it has to go around and around in a circle as it goes through the turbulator. And that helps stir up the water and it increases the heat transfer coefficient between the water and the cold plate. Now, the nice thing about the turbulator cold plates is instead of the microfin cold plates, uh, we can create a lot of heat transfer without creating a cold plate that's also a filter that would catch any dirt or debris uh, that's in the liquid cooling system. Now, is there a ratio of uh, turbulators to watts or capabilities in thermal performance? So basically the, the numbers, if you want to get scientific, for the microfin cold plate, they're on the order of 1,000 watts uh, per meter squared per degree C. And with a turbulator cold plate, the heat transfer coefficient is eight or 9,000 watts per meter per degree C. So it's a lot more heat transfer. There's less area in the, in the uh, turbulator cold plate. So net, net, the, cold bl the turbulator performance is about the same, uh, but it's much more resistant to contamination and corrosion, uh, which are the kind of issues that you run into uh, with uh, computers that have been sitting in a liquid cooled system for four years or more. Now, is there a strong difference between using a metal turbulator versus the plastic turbulator? I know there's, there might be benefits towards uh, heat dissipation, but corrosion properties between the two. 
so uh, the heat transfer is a lot better with a copper turbulator because it transfers heat from the water both on the outside and the inside. And as far as corrosion is concerned, we've been running these soldered in turbulators on some of the cold plates on our servers at Sandia uh, for about nine months now and we've seen no issue whatsoever with the corrosion. So I know with uh, coolant there's a big talk of uh, different chemicals and uh, of course water. Why do you guys uh, prefer going with water? We like to use water instead of PG25 because it has better heat transfer characteristics and it's easier to pour it down the drain when you're done with it as opposed to having to call somebody to haul it away. With our system, we just use a tiny bit of oxidizing and non-oxidizing biocides to kill off any algae or bacteria in the system. And then we use about 40 parts per million of molybdate uh, to prevent corrosion on the stainless steel and copper surfaces. So I know you talked briefly on the uh, 2000 watt coal plate uh, design. What is the limit? Like, do you run into any theoretical limits of like what you can cool or how much density you can cool down? Well, that's a good question. So this over here is a rocket engine that we developed in 2017 for a DARPA project. And this engine is water cooled and this is about 60 kilowatts of heat that it puts out. This one runs at about 2300 watts per square centimeter of heat transfer as opposed to the, the chips which are putting out maybe 100 watts per square centimeter. So there's a lot of room uh, for higher power chips as the chip companies make them. These are the manifolds that we use for our systems. In uh, some cases for low power systems we use a smaller manifold, high power systems we use a larger manifold, in this case, we can use a hose on a barb because our system runs under vacuum. So there's no pressure that's gonna push the hose off the barb like you would have in a positive pressure system. These are just push to connect fittings. You just push the tube in there. It's in there strong. Pull this, push the ring back, pull the tube off. So we also have other manifolds for 100 kilowatt racks or if you wanna build a 500 kilowatt rack, we'll be happy to design a manifold for that it's gonna be about three inches square. So we've been telling you about the 2000 watt cold plate that Childine's working on, and this is it, this is the demo room that they've got set up. I've got Carl here that's gonna tell us about it, but looking at this thing, I can't tell if we're dealing with mad scientist or weird science to get this thing operational. <laughs> you took like all the parts of the, the CDU, exploded them out onto this workbench, and this is a functioning demo. What the heck are we looking at? <laughs> All right, Brian. Yes, this is our mad science in here. Okay, yes, mad this science. is all good mad science. So um, you are right. This is a test bench to test uh, 2000 watt cold plate technology. Right. Um, uh, you know, a year or so ago, ARPA E came to us and they told us the roadmap had 2000 watt chips coming in fast, which sounded incredible at the time. But now, after but now we've seen we've... even just what gets launched at GTC every year is not so well, unrealistic. Right. We're talking to all the uh, computer chip vendors, and they're telling us, uh, be ready, they're coming. Okay. So we developed uh, some cold plate technology that could dissipate the 2,000 watts of heat. Well, yeah, so it's tricky, right? If I hand you a shipping AMD Epic CPU and say, cool this, mm -hmm. you have it. You have the server. You can design the plate and then go cool it. When they're telling you to cool a mythical 2000 watt beast, it's a little bit different. Right, it is. So we don't have a 2000 watt chip at our disposal. Right. So what we do is we make a thermal simulator. All right. And so on the bench top here, um, this white device here is a um, 2000 watt heater, basically. That's okay. simulating the, the thermal load of a, of a chip of that magnitude. So we have a, a big copper block in there with some heaters embedded in it. Okay. The heaters we can measure with a very precise power meter how much power we're putting into it. And we can tune it and turn it up or down and turn up the power to 2,000 watts. Is 2,000 watts the max that you can get out of this mystery block of heat? About, yeah. Okay. That's about the max. Maybe 2,100 okay. uh, watts or so. But about, you're about there. So what we have done is we've taken our next generation uh, CDU technology, and like you said, we've kind of exploded it on the bench. Right. Um, so what we have here is we have a, a gear pump that's right. sucking the fluid through the system, and that gives us our negative pressure. That's your right? vacuum. That gives us our vacuum. So we, if we have a leak, it doesn't leak water out. Right. Okay. We've done a lot of the leak show, so you don't have to worry about right, that by now. Right. By now, if you guys don't get that this thing doesn't leak, then maybe rewind and start over. Right. But this doesn't leak. So then we take the pump and we pump through a cold plate 
okay. the heat exchanger. It's and a little tiny heat exchanger. A little tiny baby heat exchanger. Okay. And then from there, we pump it into this reservoir, this flask for, for uh, temporarily, right. this flask. And then uh, we suck it back through. We go through a uh, precision flow meter okay. and then back through the cold plate. And along the way, we have some uh, instrumentation. We have some temperature sensors, some pressure measurements. So if I turn the switch on, I'm enabling the heaters. We are at a little over 2,000 watts. Okay. It's and sort of anticlimactic. Yeah. That it works. It. It's just doing its job. Okay. Not a lot of uh, bells and whistles. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. <laughs> You've got all these devices all over the table, so I would suggest there right. are some bells and well, some whistles. Well, most of this is just for our development, just so Understood. we can feel good about what we're doing and know that we're getting the data and everything is working as it's supposed to work. So now knowing what you know after this demo, this example, this is good enough to take into production, you think, when the chips are there and, and ready for that uh, cold plate. Right, so as soon as the chips are available, uh, we've got a little bit of uh, manufacturing to do. Right, you know, just manufacturing to design, it, right. And then we're ready to go. Either so the, the, the big trick here, though, is this looks a lot like some of your other cold plates without the fins and the hybrid, and in this case, and the little pieces on the ends are a little bigger, maybe there's a little more water flow going through. Anything new with the uh, turbulators uh, inside there? No, so we're still using our turbulator technology. Okay. Right? So our turbul te turbulator technology um, enhances heat transfer right. over um, uh, microfins. Right. Right. So we can get higher heat transfer coefficients than microfins can um, with turbulators. And these are still the large metal ones? Is that what we're using in here, the copper ones? Correct. Inside the cold plate, we have a series of drilled passages. Right. And then these turbulators are brazed inside those passages, and then the fluid circulates right. in this helical passage uh, through the cold plate. Which is the most efficient way for all the fluid to be at the same temperature, remove the most heat out right. of the cold plate. Right. We've talked about that a little bit. So how many of these are inside this cold plate? So this one, there are six. Okay, six but they're a little bit larger than some of the other ones that we've seen they're earlier They're this today. exact size. Right, but this one I'm saying is a little larger than some of the other ones you use in other cold plates. That is correct, right, yes, right, yes. Right. Okay, yes. All, right, all right, so we're at 2,000 watts on this demo build. So Childine is showing that they're, they've got solutions not only for today, but clearly for tomorrow as well. That is correct. Thanks for checking out this first part of the video. We've got so much content, we decided to chop this up into a few parts. Come back soon for part number two.